Good evening, everyone. And, uh, you know, for those devoted guests out on the West Coast, uh, good late afternoon. Thanks for joining us. My name is Eric Story. I'm the Outreach Manager at the Laurier Centre for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies in Waterloo, Ontario. And I and the rest of the folks at the Laurier Military Centre, as well as our partners, the Canadian Battlefields Foundation, the Juno Beach Centre Association, and the Gregg Centre for the Study of War and Society, would like to welcome you all to the fifth installment of the Maple Leaf Route webinar series. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the extensive history of the land in which the Laurier Military Centre resides. Our office is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. In 1701, this, fell, this land fell under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, a treaty that was part of the Great Peace of Montreal in the same year that marked the end of the Beaver Wars of the 17th century. It represented and continues to represent today an eternal agreement to not only share and protect resources, but also solve conflicts peacefully. 80 some years later in 1784, the Haldimand Proclamation was signed between the Haudenosaunee and the British Crown following the American Revolution. And the Haudenosaunee were given a tract of land that extended six miles on either side of the Grand River from its source just north of Orangeville today to Lake Erie. Today, this treaty territory remains the homeland of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities, as well as the home of many indigenous peoples across Turtle Island and acknowledging their presence in the past and present reminds everyone of the responsibilities we all hold as treaty people. Now, this may be a very kind of familiar script that you've heard from for those who have been tuning in for the past, um, I guess we're coming up now on two months. Um, but for those who are here for the first time, um, some of you might be wondering what exactly is the Maple Leaf Route webinar series and what exactly we're going to be doing. Well, since May and all the way until September this year, we've been following the Canadians and will continue following the Canadians through the battles of Normandy in 1944. From the D-Day beaches to the capture of Caen in July, which we have done over the past couple of webinars, and the fighting towards Falaise in August. Now this fighting and the cost of it, it was enormous. From the 6th of June to the 23rd of August, over 5,000 Canadian service people lost their lives. And any visitor to the war cemeteries in Normandy cannot, he cannot help but be moved by such losses. Our nine part series, the fifth of which taking place tonight, features a range of historians asking a range of historical questions. Some of these questions will be tactical, others will consider the little known role of Canadian women on the battlefield as Sarah Glassford did with us uh, just a month ago. And others yet will explore the importance of morale as we're going to do tonight and the puzzle of psychological stress. All of our speakers, however, will reflect in some way on the ever-changing ways we remember the Canadians in the battles of Normandy. Now, if, there, if after tonight's event and even throughout the series, you feel you have learned something of value, please consider donating to the Canadian Battlefields Foundation and the Juno Beach Center Association. During these difficult pandemic times, your donations will keep future tours alive and ensure that the Canadian contributions to the Second World War will not be forgotten. Now this month, the Juno Beach Center Association is promoting the Remembrance Day race. For only $50, you will receive a racing kit that includes a medal, a Lancaster bomber pin, Remembrance Day flag, a poppy, poppy seeds, and a racing bib. Participants can choose from one of three historically significant distance options, the Strong Point at 1,500 meters, Juno Beach at eight kilometers, and Remembrance at 21.1 kilometers. And fundraise for the Juno Beach Center while they walk or run in order for a chance to win a variety of prizes. Join the Juno Beach Center's journey of remembrance and gratitude as they honor the men and women who served during the Second World War. Now you can donate to both the Canadian Battlefields Foundation and the Juno Beach Center Association by going to our website, canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar and clicking donate at the top of the page. I'll say that website just one more time. It's canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar. Now, I would like to remind everyone before I turn it over to my co-host for this evening, I would like to remind everyone that you might be finding that the closed captioning at the bottom of your screen is just a little bit distracting. 
And you can actually toggle that on and off, going to the bottom of your screen, clicking that CC button at the bottom, that will allow you to turn closed captioning on and off. And if questions come to you at any point during this presentation, please feel free to share them in the Q&A function. Again, it's located at the bottom of your window. Um, and when you do ask a question, again, at any point during the presentation, please let us know where you're coming from because we love to hear where everyone is tuning in from uh, for these webinars. But I'll now turn it over to Dr. Jeff Hayes, professor in the Department of History at the University of Waterloo and a director of the Canadian Battlefields Foundation who has co-led with Brigadier General David Patterson many tours over the past 20 years. Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Eric, and welcome everyone. The CBF, uh, Canadian Battlefields Foundation, La Fondation Canadienne des Champs de Bataille, was, as uh, some of you already know, the brainchild of a group of determined veterans led by Hamilton Southam and a group of academics who were concerned that the Canadian role in the Battle of Normandy might be forgotten. The CBF and the Juno Beach Center have worked to ensure that the Canadian role in the campaign remains fresh in the minds of people who visit as well as Canadians all across the country. And six, since 2003, official ceremonies on the day, 6 June, at the Juno Beach Center have brought together uh, a wonderful variety of people, whether they're French, uh, whether they're Canadian, whether they're European or American, to reflect and remember. And the foundation has also been involved in that commemorative exercise, especially on the 7th of June, where we have traditionally held, except for the last two years, ceremonies at the Canadian Memorial Garden on the grounds of Le Memorial des Caen, at the Place de l'Ancien Boucherie in Caen, and finally in the Garden of the Abbe Ardin, where Canadian soldiers were murdered and buried in June of 1944. Since 1995, the foundation has brought together a remarkable group of men and women to tour and learn from the battlefields. This group of people have included indigenous peoples, the grandchildren of veterans, serving members of the CAF, as well as future teachers, academics, and decision makers. And we'll hear from one of these alumni in a minute. This is, uh, again, as we all know, the second year in which the CBF has been unable to organize a student tour. And as such, our president, General Marc Lessard, who we send best wishes to, agreed that a virtual tour drawing on a distinguished panel of academics would offer a chance to see the foundation's mandate in practice. So again, if you will, picture yourself on the battlefields of Normandy with some of the best guides to inform and inspire you. It is mid-July, 1944. As Lee Windsor showed us two nights or two weeks ago, Caen has fallen and the fighting around point 67 continues with enormous intensity, both on the ground and in the air. Canadian plans to punch along the Caen Falais Road in the direction of Falaise. Operations totalize and tractable are imminent. And both, as we shall see, feature enormous contributions from the air. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Mike Bechtold, a longtime friend and colleague of the Laurier Military Center, as well as a CBF alumnus from the original tour in 1995. We could call him one of the old contemptibles, I suppose. And Mike, thank you for joining us tonight. Can you just speak briefly before you introduce our speaker? What has the CBF tour meant to you? Sure. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, really pleased to be here um, to talk about the uh, CBF and to introduce a good friend of mine. But uh, Jeff, I think the, the CBF has really been a formative event in my life. I, I really kind of look at sort of a, a before and, and an after time, and that's really how important it was in, in my life and my uh, development and academic career. I was uh, lucky enough to go on the, the 95 tour, which was the inaugural tour. Um, we spent three weeks in, in Europe, which uh, seems like such a long time now. Uh, we were in residence at the Abbey Darden, uh, that infamous place for the better part of two weeks before we hit the road and we went north to Dieppe and the Channel Ports and the Scheldt, uh, Wonsdrecht. We stayed in, in Bruges. It was, a, it was an amazing tour. We even had a, a free weekend where we could uh, take the ferry over to Portsmouth and explore the, uh, the route that the troops took, <clears throat> excuse me, coming into uh, Normandy. 
So uh, just a, a fantastic experience uh, led by uh, Terry Kopp. Uh, can't imagine anybody better to be doing that. Uh, Serge Durflinger was the, uh, the co-leader. Um, and there was a, a lot of people that, uh, that the tour had a big impact on as well. Uh, Lee Windsor, um, Dave Turnbull, Morgan Wright, uh, John Rickard, uh, people that you've probably heard those names before. And uh, I think uh, in the same way that it uh, changed my life, the, the tour had a huge impact on, on them as well. And uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, we're now 26 years after that tour started and it's still going is, is really a, a testament to, uh, well, it was the Canadian Battle of Normandy Foundation back then, Canadian Battlefields Foundation now, but it continues to take students over there and, and show them the battlefields and, and allow them to uh, sort of immerse themselves in, in the study of, of Canada and the, the Second World War and the First World War in a way that just isn't possible in the classroom. And uh, it's such a, an amazing experience and I hope it can continue continue for uh, another 26 years. Um, Alex Fitzgerald Black, who's our uh, uh, guest speaker tonight, um, isn't a CBF alumni, but please don't hold that against him. Um, he has done his time on the battlefields and, and uh, has gone over there and, and walked the battlefields and, and uh, basically gone on a tour that was patterned after the CBF tour. Um, Alex is the operations and outreach manager at the, the Juno Beach Center uh, Association. He uh, has uh, an MA in military history from the University of New Brunswick at the, the Gregg Center and uh, a second MA from uh, Western University in uh, public history. He's uh, a published author. He's published uh, this book, which I, I highly recommend to you, Eagles Over Husky, about the uh, Allied Air Campaign in the Sicilian Campaign. And uh, I've known Alex for a long time and, and consider him a good friend ever since he was a, uh, an undergrad at, at Laurier for more than a, a decade ago. Um, he's gonna be talking about uh, close air support and soldiers' perceptions of it in the Normandy campaign. Um, he's somebody that uh, sort of lives and breathes air power. He uh, had the opportunity to go flying in a B-25 a couple summers ago, um, his wonderful wife, Lindsay, and I think his in-laws and parents uh, banded together to, to get him that trip, which must have been a fantastic experience. But uh, now he's going to, uh, to talk about air support in Normandy. So uh, everybody uh, buckle up and uh, let's go for a ride on the air support roller coaster. Alex. Make sure I get that going properly. Well, thank you so very much, Mike, for that very kind introduction. And Mentioning that flight brings back memories uh, of the B-25 at the Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton, and it was just an incredible experience to be up in that aircraft. Um, I'd also love for Mike to stick around, I'm sure he will, and help me answer questions because he knows some of this stuff, especially for Normandy, uh, a little bit better than even I do, of course, and, and so I really will appreciate that. Um, I need to take a moment to thank um, Eric Story and everyone at the Laurier Center working in the background to pull this off. This has been quite an incredible um, series of talks that we've been uh, very privileged to watch the last uh, uh, few months. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're only about halfway through, so there's still a, a lot more to go uh, coming forward. Uh, I need to also thank Jeff Hayes for the invitation to present and the CBF's initiative in uh, organizing this speaker series. Um, Lastly, I guess I want to thank the audience uh, for coming and joining us, uh, going on this uh, virtual tour of Normandy. Um, you know, we wouldn't be here without you. And I know that there's actually at least one veteran I know in the audience as well. And so once again, thank you for your service and, and thank you for being here. So I want to get started um, by kind of explaining how this talk is organized. Um, and essentially, I want to do a, a few things. One is I want to give everybody kind of a, a bird's eye view of Overlord or the operation uh, to land in Normandy and to fight in Normandy and destroy the German military there and, and give you a bird, bird's eye view of that. I want to provide you with some context and examine a few bigger questions. Uh, actually, uh, Lee Windsor, whose talk was you know two weeks ago, uh, got me thinking about some of these things. Next, in, in a true Canadian Battlefields Foundation fashion, and this is a tradition that really, um, I think, is involved in just about every battlefield tour that's advertised out there, especially ones for educational purposes. Um, 
I want to give you a micro history or a biography of a flying officer, Harvey Edgar Jones. And I want to take a moment to remember him as one of at least hundreds of Canadian airmen who were killed in Normandy. Next, I want to give you a little bit of a briefing about air support and morale. I want to define some terms and examine some capabilities and kind of leave you with a meaningful meme potentially to think about during the course of the rest of my talk. And then lastly, we'll get into that air support roller coaster and track the Canadian Army's interactions with air support through the Battle of Normandy. So I think just about everybody here knows what D-Day is and what the Battle of Normandy is. I mean, you've been inundated with this stuff for the last uh, two months almost. But it's important to point out, this is the largest combined military operation in history. It's not the largest operation in history. It's not the largest amphibious operation in history, depending on what numbers you're interested in talking about. But it is the largest combined military operation in history. And that's very important because what that means is it's all about, you know, it's the air support and the naval support that really makes this a big deal um, in terms of, you know, that, that, that form of significance in history. There were some 11,000, almost 12,000 aircraft assigned to support the Normandy landings on D-Day. It's probably the largest concentration of aircraft in a geographic space in one day, more than likely. And we also had 7,000, nearly 7,000 warships and uh, landing craft uh, supporting the operation. So we can't, we can't forget those things. Um, it's also important to remember that the Battle of Normandy really began months before D-Day, especially where the Air Force and the Navy are concerned, and especially where the Air Force is concerned. And I wanted to recall Lee Windsor's point last day about how D-Day captured our imaginations when most of the dying for Canada occurred in the fields and hills beyond the beach. Yet at the same time, we often neglect the role of the Royal Canadian Navy and the Allied navies more generally, and the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Allied Air Forces more generally beyond this single day. And Lee asked us, you know, does death figure in our attribution of significance? I think he suggested that it does, and I think I agree with him. And so I wanted to share some figures with you. These are figures from John Terrain's The Right of the Line. Uh, which is a really great reference book if you need anything on the RAF in World War II, wherever, you know, at least in the war in the West. The Allies lost nearly 2,000 aircraft in the nine weeks before D-Day. And of this figure, approximately 700 were British Commonwealth, Canadian, Australian, British, what, what have you, squadrons. And there were 12,000 officers and men, both British Commonwealth and American, killed or missing in these operations before D-Day. And we have a very limited understanding in Canada of what this means in terms of Canadian losses. Now, if we turn from D-Day to the 31st of August, 1944, you have a further over 4,000 Allied aircraft lost with nearly 17,000 aircrew killed or missing. The RAF share of that, that includes the Canadians, is around 2,000 aircraft with over 8,100 8, air, air crew killed or missing. Once again, we don't really have an understanding of what that means in terms of Canadian losses. It's certainly in the hundreds. What about the French? Again, does death figure in our attribution of significance? The French paid a heavy price for their freedom. Um, these figures are from uh, Stephen A. Bork's book, uh, Beyond the Beach, The Allied War Against France. That's quite an interesting title, The Allied War Against France. This coming from a um, former uh, U.S. Army officer um, who now uh, uh, teaches history. Um, there were approximately 12,500 civilian deaths in the invasion zone in three um, regions of France that Operation Overlord took place in during the Battle of Normandy. And about 60% or 7,500 of these were due to Allied air attack. Between 60 and 70,000 French civilians were killed in the Allied air offensive against France throughout the war. If we want to zoom in and look at a micro view, at corseau sur mer 14 civilians were killed in the D-Day bombardment. At bernier sur mer 27 civilians are estimated to have been killed. And at saint aubin sur mer 25 civilians killed. The total estimate, uh, and I don't think those numbers quite add up because there's other reporting uh, areas, 
um, is 66 kill civilians killed in the Juneau Beach sector alone, from, mostly from the air bombardment on D-Day. And so Stephen Bork you know, has this quote, that, you know, the French learned to fear aircraft overhead in the same way they avoided German military patrols or panicked when they heard a knock at the door. For several months in early 1944, the Americans, British and Canadians were not liberators, but the enemy. I think he's referring mostly to the air forces there, uh, but obviously artillery had its role to play as well. Now, I wanted to share this map with you because when you look at the Battle of Normandy, you tend to see maps you know, of D-Day, of the landing beaches, of the bridgehead. The Air Force and the Navy, but the Air Force in particular, are concerned about a much wider range of territory here. And this map gives you a good sense of that and all the different things that they're going to get up to in preparation for and during the Battle of Normandy. So you can see there's a whole bunch of markings on this map. You've got uh, areas of fighter cover marked over the approaches to the beaches and then over where the beaches are themselves. You've got the routes of the airborne uh, transport forces uh, delivering the glider and airborne uh, para parachute troops. Uh, that was the Americans there and the British over here. You've got a tactical recce area or reconnaissance area where tactical aircraft um, are scouting ahead to, to, to view things inland to see where German troops are moving, you know, towards the beaches. You've also got a photo reconnaissance area, and, and there's the photo reconnaissance effort to talk about in terms of the intelligence that that provided for the Allies on D-Day. You've got this ring here, which is the area which, within which enemy airfields are going to be attacked. And so the, 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 the Allied bombers forces in particular are going to be going after these airfields to try to destroy enemy aircraft on the ground where possible, and also to get the Germans to respond and to, um, you know, you know, have to fight the uh, fight the escort fighters in the process of defending their airfields. You've got big blocks here talking about, you know, showing the coastal command operations going on, and they're concentrated primarily at the bottlenecks of where the English Channel uh, goes into, kind of the, you know, eventually the North Sea up here and into the Atlantic over here. You know, Coastal Command is playing a significant role both in terms of anti-submarine uh, patrols and in terms of maritime strike um, assignments to destroy and degrade uh, what, what remains of the German Navy and also the German, uh, much smaller German surface specials like destroyers and even smaller craft that are potentially deadly as well. You've got a lot of cities marked on this map uh, in red dots, and those are communication centers, mainly railway center targets. So you've got a whole bunch concentrated up here in the Pas de Calais area, and there's a significance to that I'll talk about in a second, but there's others, you know, uh, there's bridge crossings and uh, marshalling yards that the bombers are going after. Unfortunately, um, these marshalling yards in particular are smack dab in the center of old European towns and cities. And, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I hate to say it, but it's not really precision bombing in the Second World War. It's mainly carpet bombing. And when you bomb something like that, you're going to kill civilians in the process. But the idea is to paralyze the railway system, which is marked in, in the black lines on this map, and force the Germans to use other methods of transportation to get their troops uh, uh, to the beachhead. There's a whole lot going on here beyond the scope of the beaches. And I can, you know, I'll talk about even more of it in a second. So what the heck is the Royal Canadian Air Force up to? Well, um, the Royal Air Force command structure was very much based on functional lines. So you had Bomber Command, which is those heavy bomber, Lancaster, uh, Halifax, Sterling squadrons. The Canadians supplied, the RCAF supplied 14 squadrons to that force. Coastal Command, you know, again, maritime strike aircraft, anti-submarine warfare aircraft. They're providing, uh, the Canadians are providing five squadrons, no transport command squadrons from the RCAF at this point in the war. Um, Second Tactical Air Force uh, has uh, 17 squadrons that are RCAF, so that's a pretty significant contribution. And Air Defense Great Britain, which is a basically a defensive command that, um, you know, essentially is the, the, these two commands are the, uh, the, the Tactical Air Force and Air Defense Great Britain are basically they kind of chopped the uh, chopped fighter command in half and air defense Great Britain is, is defending Great Britain, whereas the tactical air force goes with the army into France. 
we also have to remember that about throughout the war, from 39 to 45, about 60% of RCAF aircrew served in RAF squadrons at one time or another. Um, by D-Day, this number was much smaller. I don't know if I want to say much smaller, but it was significantly smaller. Uh, it wasn't quite 60%. It might have been closer to between 40 and 50%. I can't quite remember if there's even a, even a proper number on that, but it's a, the Canadianization effort to get Canadians into RCAF squadrons is well underway in mid-1944. I've also, you know, I've mentioned a number of these roles, but here's a list here. You know, you've got air bombardment roles, and there's a whole slew of targets there. You've got ground attack roles. Um, you've got maritime strike. Transport command is concerning itself once the landings have occurred, especially with casualty evacuation, because the bridgehead is so small, especially in the early days, it's really important to get some of those wounded out and into the UK um, so that they can be properly cared for in, in hospitals back in England. Um, you've got the, the transport command is doing supply transport and drops in support of the army. They're also doing, you know, parachute and glider troop delivery and insertions uh, uh, before the invasion and even during the invasion at times. Um, you've got the anti-submarine cork patrols, which are literally on that map. You know, they're trying to put the cork in the bottle, essentially, and prevent U-boats from getting into the invasion area. You've got the special duties units, which are basically, you know, delivering uh, supplies and um, operatives uh, to the resistance forces in Europe. You've got deception operations going on, and that's kind of in two major forms. One is, and I showed you the map, how there's a whole lot of um, uh, uh, railway center targets up in this area. Part of that's because it's a heavily, you know, there's a lot of railways in that area. And part of it is because they're trying to convince the Germans that, well, maybe the actual attack is going to come at the Pas de Calais. And there's a whole bunch of deception going on around that. And part of it is the air campaign and the emphasis of the air campaign. There are also, uh, there's some uh, the second kind of form of deception uh, that the Air Force is helping with in particular. I mean, one is that they're defending uh, British airspace and preventing the Germans from getting proper photo reconnaissance photographs of everything they want. But another is they actually have, for instance, um, 617 Squadron, the, the famed dam busters, they send them up with a bunch of aluminum foil strips, you know, get them to fly um, pre-prescribed courses and dump these aluminum strips out to create radar signatures. And they're actually, you know, trying to simulate successfully, I might add, the um, an allied invasion occurring at the Pas de Calais at the same time as the D-Day landings are taking place as well. So there's so many things going on. You've got day fighters, you've got night fighters, Intruder aircraft, whose job is to kind of go and roam uh, into, into enemy territory at night and kind of shoot up uh, targets of opportunity, shoot up airfields, uh, that sort of thing. And I've talked about the photo and, and tactical reconnaissance as well. There's so much going on. You know, can't, the commitment and the cost, Canada on D-Day. The only thing I really want to say here is we're all familiar. I think that the, 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 the typical number we talk about is 359 Canadians who were killed on D-Day. I have to tell you that that figure is incomplete. It's the Canadian Army figure. It includes 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade landing at Juneau, and it includes the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion landing on the uh, eastern flank of the bridgehead, but it does not include Canadian airmen. And I estimate that there are approximately 22 Canadian airmen who were killed on D-Day. There were seven Royal Canadian Air Force aircraft lost. Again, a bunch of Canadians are flying with um, foreign squadrons, and therefore their aircraft aren't counted here. And we've committed 39 squadrons. If I tally all those squadrons and the different commands up, 39 RCAF squadrons, pretty much almost every squadron we have serving overseas at this time with a few uh, exceptions. Uh, so it's a really big effort for the RCAF and the Air Force uh, more generally. As I said, I wanted to briefly introduce you um, to one of those 22 Canadian airmen um, who, who went out on, well, the night of the 5th of um, uh, uh, June 1944, in this case, and never made it back. Um, Flying Officer Harvey Edgar Jones um, was born on July 1st, Dominion Day, 1917. He lived in the Niagara Falls area and uh, was fairly well educated uh, for, for his time. He went through, did, did, did high school, went off to the University of Toronto to do a Bachelor of Commerce degree. 
Um, honestly, you know, his story is like just about any story of a Canadian, you know, in, in the early 20s, in their early 20s, um, you know, works in the summer at the local kind of tourism shop out at Niagara, eventually gets a job in sales and advertising at Procter & Gamble, and eventually joins the RCAF on August 1st of 1941, and he was 24 years old at the time. Um, he does his training. I'm going to go through this really quickly uh, in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Um, eventually finds his way into an operations training unit, operational training unit in Greenwood, Nova Scotia, where he learns to fly uh, a Lockheed Hudson aircraft. And that's kind of a maritime, uh, mainly uses a maritime reconnaissance aircraft. He's sent overseas um, in early 1943, actually ends up he goes to the United Kingdom, ends up in Iceland for a bit, in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, uh, doing anti-submarine patrols uh, with uh, 269 Squadron RIF. I told you many Canadian airmen were serving in British squadrons. Here's an example. Um, eventually, he returns with the squadron to Davis-Stowe Moor in southwest England, and he's assigned and reassigned, including to some Canadian units. But he eventually joins uh, 233 Squadron with Transport Command in February of 1944. Uh, and that's a picture of him. He's on the right there, uh, leaning on the suitcase, uh, looking at the lovely uh, pinup girls. And um, uh, that's him in, in, in Iceland. So he and his mates uh, prepare for Operation Tonga, which is the sixth airborne division's role in Operation Overlord. And his, him and his unit, uh, they, 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 they fly, um, uh, Dakota aircraft, the C-47, and they're going to deliver airborne troops and supplies uh, uh, to the invasion uh, area. They're actually given drop zone K, which is the furthest inland drop zone, and I'll uh, show you where that is in a second. So just to get everybody oriented, here's kind of a standard D-Day map. There's where the uh, American Airborne Divisions landed. There's where the British Airborne Divisions landed. That's what we're really concerned about. And of course, you have the beaches in between. So during Operation Tonga, um, Harvey Edgar Jones's aircraft, he's the pilot, he's the, he's, he, he leads the crew. Um, they're aiming for drop zone K, which is at the bottom uh, of your map there to deliver uh, airborne forces and supplies, as I said. They get hit by flak crossing the coast, and it looks like there's a small fire that started um, on the aircraft, but no one really, uh, no one really observes it right away. The paratroopers get away, and then suddenly the fire really starts to break out. Um, basically, what happens in a nutshell is that um, fl uh, Flying Officer Jones. Um, he tries to keep the aircraft aloft to give his crew a chance to bail out. He gives them the order to abandon the aircraft. The, ne the navigator and the second pilot up front with him both abandon the aircraft. But the wireless operator, um, who's another Canadian named Engelberg, goes to get his chute and to check on Jones. I guess the chute might have been up near the cockpit or something. And it's possible, we don't really know, Jones may have refused his parachute at this point. Unfortunately, in the process of trying to make a, a crash landing, uh, the aircraft dives into the ground near Bazenville, northeast of Troron. And I've marked that position, uh, the approximate location with a star on the map there. And basically, um, uh, Jones is killed. Uh, he's thrown from the aircraft and killed. Um, Engelberg uh, survives the crash, but is, is severely wounded in a start, and actually they crash near a, a French farmhouse, and the villagers start to take care of him. Um, the second pilot, Flight Sergeant Dalborf, returned to the scene of the crash the next day on D-Day. He finds that Jones is dead, and that Engelberg is in the care of these villagers. The original burial is arranged in the area, and it's, it's quite quite a heartening story. Um, the original grave is eventually moved uh, to the Ranville War Cemetery, but during the, until the end of the war and until that happened, I think in the late 1940s, um, the, 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 the French family whose land they landed on um, and whose, where their grave was located uh, kept care of the grave. 
And um, interestingly enough, um, <laughs> the son of the French farmer was actually killed in the crash. So, you know, obviously they took um, it very seriously and wanted to care for both, I'm assuming, their son's grave as well as um, uh, the, uh, Harvey Edgar Jones's grave. Basically, this is interesting because um, there's actually an effort to try to get um, Flying Officer Jones of Victoria Cross for his actions, uh, trying to keep the aircraft aloft long enough for the crew to get out. And it actually gets as far as the air ministry, but it tur it's turned down at that point. And there's some likely reasons for it. Um, so here's some of the criteria in terms of air operations for the Victoria Cross. One is a Victoria Cross generally should be awarded for getting into trouble and not getting out of trouble. I think we can all agree uh, Harvey Edgar Jones was trying to, um, he was getting himself into trouble by staying at the controls of those air, that aircraft. So yeah, check mark. Um, it was a desperate act to save others. Yep, yeah, we can check that. However, he was the pilot in command of the aircraft. And therefore it was in some circles considered his duty and not uncommon valor for him to remain at the controls of the aircraft to allow his crew to escape. This was actually a fairly common thing that happened in bomber command. Um, and I think that's kind of the comparison they made is, you know, if we give Harvey Edgar Jones a VC in this case, well, we'd have to look at a whole bunch of those cases. And, and, and I guess they may not have been willing to do that. Because the Victoria Cross is one of only three posthumous awards, if you are killed in the action that you're uh, recommended for the medal, you can only get the Victoria Cross in the case of combat, George Cross in the case of non-combat, or a mention in dispatches. So. Harvey Edgar Jones is mentioned in dispatches. And nobody, hardly anybody knows who he is because of that, right? This is, speaks to the importance of, um, it speaks to the importance of the Victoria Cross as a symbol and, and as something that helps us to remember as well. A Couple more pictures of him. So that's my little biography. And now in, in, the, fat, in the, the tradition of the CBF, you know, they, you, students get to do a biography and then typically they do a stand. They go to a location on the battlefield um, where they talk about a subject that they've done research on and is perhaps significant uh, to them as well. And so we'll talk about the air support roller coaster. I wanna quickly define air support and morale. So air support, I think is a bit of a loaded term uh, which can arguably encompass all missions which directly or indirectly support the work of the ground and surface forces. That list, that laundry list I gave you earlier, in theory, those are all potentially air support tasks. You are supporting the army, maybe not directly, but in some way. Now it's typically, air support is typically understood by soldiers and sailors on the battlefield or at sea as air support within close proximity to themselves Close air support is the term for this typically, or direct air support in some, uh, is some of the other language. The important thing here is seeing is believing. The army or the Navy in, in some cases needs to see it. That's it's air support if they can see it, if it's operating overhead, if they can see how it's integrated into what they're doing. Close or direct air support can then be divided into both pre-planned close air support and on-call or impromptu uh, air support against kind of fleeting targets. So that's you know pre-planned. We, we, we make a plan for an advance. We're going to send the bombers in ahead, and they're going to clear us a path. Uh, on-call, well, uh, you know, uh, Canadian Infantry Battalion sees a, um, an anti-tank gun that's stopping the armor from getting forward. Let's call up an aircraft and see if they can strafe that and, uh, and help us you know, uh, take out that position. I have a couple of definitions of morale down here, um, uh, you know, for you to read and, and, and to consider. Um, basically, high morale could be taken to mean a high willingness to participate in combat. Low morale could mean a low willingness to participate in combat. Um, you know, that's kind of the simple way to put it. And one of the things I want you to consider, and that's why this meme, meme is on the screen, we often are, you know, we love to talk about, you know, we, you know, air power historians often uh, love to talk about the effects of air support on the battlefield or, you know, of a, of a bomber and the damage it did to a target, that sort of thing. Physical damage is one thing. Um, the psychological damage, even if temporary, 
is something also to consider and, and not just damage. I'm going to talk today about both the positive impacts of air support on your own troops and potentially some of the negative impacts uh, that, had a that played a factor in Normandy. It's important to kind of understand the larger context of how air commanders viewed air support during the Second World War. Um, they kind of had a, a priority scheme and there's three kind of levels or priorities. The priority one is the destruction of German air power. You can't really do anything unless you have what's termed air superiority, right? You, you need you know, the ability to have an effect on the battle theater or on the battle space or beyond the battlefield, wherever you want, kind of when you want, with you know, hopefully minimal interference from the enemy air force, right? And that's the first priority, get rid of the enemy air force um, or degrade it to such a point that they cannot have a significant impact on the situation. Priority two, isolation of the battle area. This is often termed interdiction in the literature. The idea being, you know, yeah, targets on the battlefield are maybe important, but maybe even more important are the targets beyond the battlefield. Um, you know, we talked about some of these things, the railway systems, um, you know, bridges, roads, um, you know, troop, troop transport, all these things. If you can stop the enemy from getting its supplies, it's going to be much more difficult for them to fight. Priority three, which is, you know, the army may not like this very much, is air ground coordination. And that is that, you know, working together to destroy the enemy, um, you know, calling in air support, you know, when necessary, either again on call or in a, um, this is essentially the close air support fu function, right? Either on call or um, a pre-planned strike. We also need to remember the limitations of the technology of the time. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about fighter bomber accuracy here. Basically, the important thing to understand is that the Typhoon, uh, for instance, which was a you know, um, uh, fairly successful fighter bomber aircraft, uh, typically armed with either uh, you know, two 500 or two 1,000 pound bombs or eight rockets under the wings, also having um, uh, four uh, 20 millimeter cannon, um, their accuracy was very poor in general. So the, 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 the important thing to understand is dive bombing is pretty much the least accurate, the least possibility of getting a hit. Rockets are a little bit better. And machine guns and cannon fire are the best because you're putting more rounds down range at the enemy. Unfortunately, those things are not powerful enough to really harm tanks or really dug in positions. And so that's, that's kind of the, the difficulty is the most accurate weapon is also the one that can't go after the targets the army really wants the Air Force to go after. But it can do a good job at attacking um, enemy troop transports behind the lines, um, German motor vehicles, fuel bowsers carrying the fuel for the tanks and the other vehicles, you know, horse-drawn vehicles as well. These things are very susceptible to cannon and machine gun fire from the air. And it's typically a lot easier to hit them. Um, it's also important to understand that, you know, again, uh, perhaps the aircraft like the, the, the Typhoon were much better, not so much at destroying a tank directly, but indirectly destroying a tank or, you know, limiting its mobility by dealing with some of these other vehicles, destroying their fuel supply, um, blocking the tanks with other destroyed vehicles so they can't move about the battlefield, that sort of thing. So just just a little note there, and Ian Goodersen's book, Air Power at the Battlefront, I, I, I highly recommend that if you're really interested in this subject. And he goes into much more than fighter bombers. He talks about, you know, close air support on a number of, um, a number of capacities. So I'm just going to switch my, well, not really switch anything for you guys here. I just need to get my, uh, my notes up because I'm changing tact a little bit. Uh, I think I lost my PowerPoint there. One sec. Get that back up and then this up. All right. So this is getting into the air support roller coaster. Um, and this is a paper I actually gave a couple of years ago at the Laurier conference. And so I'll go through it here with you. Um, the literature on air power in the Battle of Normandy is, is extensive. Um, popular historians, as I've mentioned, um, they often focus on the pilots and the aircraft they flew, like the Hawker Typhoon and the P-47 Thunderbolt in the case of the Americans. And they oftenly mistakenly overemphasize their, their effectiveness as tank killers. 
They do little to change the overall narrative that it was overwhelming Allied military superiority, especially in the air, that won the day in Normandy. More scholarly approaches, especially in recent decades, focus on the limits of these weapon systems, the pilots, and the air support systems that the Air Force and Army relied upon. Terry Kopp, who we heard from on our D-Day uh, webinar, has rightly argued that the Allies' overwhelming air dominance did not mean that close air support was anything like a silver boot bullet for Canadian or Allied troops. In the late 1990s, Ian Gooderson's book that I just showed you argued that much of the benefit from air support is psychological. This is rather harder to measure than the number of targets destroyed by aircraft, which is difficult to verify in itself, even when the army later takes control of the target area. Nevertheless, the Germans feared air power and limited their daylight road moves accordingly. On the 12th of June, 1944, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel complained to Field Marshal Keitel, chief of the German Armed Forces High Command, quote, the enemy has complete control of the air over the battle area up to a distance of 100 kilometers behind the front and with powerful fighter bomber and bomber formations immobilizes almost all traffic by day on roads or in open country. Movements of our troops on the battlefield by day are thus almost entirely impossible while the enemy can operate without hindrance. In the country behind, all roads are exposed to continual air attack and it is therefore very difficult to bring up the necessary supplies of fuel and munitions. Air power ultimately removed Rommel from command in Normandy, actually I think three days from now, 77 years ago, and his replacement Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge was also concerned about the impact of unmatched Allied air power. In this case, he was concerned about the use of heavy bombers in direct support of Allied armies. He wrote, Quote, the psychological effect on the fighting forces, especially the infantry, of such a mass of bombs raining down upon them with all the force of elemental nature is a factor which must be given serious consideration. So we know something about the psychological impact of Allied air support on the Germans, but what about its impact on Allied troops? Uh, Gooderson's work only provides glimpses of this. Early on at my role, um, at the Juno Beach Center Association, I had the fortune of making an exhaustive study of the Canadian Army War Diaries for the Normandy campaign. And as an air power historian, I couldn't help myself while reading those documents and kept an eye out for references to the Allied Air Forces and their German counterparts. I developed a pair of research questions to guide my inquiry. One, what did the Canadian soldier think about the air support he received in Normandy? And two, what were the consequences of this for his morale? What I found was rather unsurprising, but fascinating nonetheless. Canadian war diaries and memoirs of fighting on the ground, including George G. Blackburn's classic, The Guns of Normandy, contain a myriad of compliments and criticisms about what the Allied Air Force was doing during the Battle of Normandy. Clear skies and one-sided dogfights against numerically and superior Allied aircraft gave the soldiers of 3rd Canadian Infantry Division confidence in the bridgehead battles of June 1944. Air support failures, including the friendly fire incidents of operations totalized and tractable, depressed Canadian troops or played a role in that to the point that some considered the Allied Air Forces a bigger threat than the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. The compliments, the peaks, and the criticisms, the valleys, present an undulating curve of Canadian soldiers' morale in Normandy, what I have termed a roller coaster. In the interest of time, I won't be delving into the physical results of Allied air support in any great detail, but what I'm interested in today is what the Canadian Army, mainly at the battalion or regimental level, thought about what the Allied Air Forces were doing on their behalf. So at least two things can be said about how the assault troops of the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division felt about their support on D-Day. The first regards the material failure of the air bombardment. The assault troops experienced the weather firsthand waiting in the English Channel for their time to land. For at least some troops, this reduced their expectations about the aerial bombardment. The war diarist of the 13th Field Regiment wrote that, quote, it was a dull morning with low clouds and poor visibility, which makes the projected aerial bombardment out of the question. The wind has died down, but the waves have not, end quote. Sentiments like this largely proved correct, and it wasn't just the air bombardment that was affected. After the Royal Winnipeg Rifles landing near Corsol sur Mer, their diarist explained how the, battalions, uh, the battalion stormed ashore. He wrote, quote, 
the bombardment having, to fa having failed to kill a single German or silence one weapon, these companies had to storm their positions cold and did so without hesitation. That's a very, very common quote. You'll see it in a lot of books about Canada on D-Day. I think Terry even referenced it in his talk a, a couple months back. Now, on the other side of the town of Corsoles, the Regina Rifle Regiment had endured a similar experience. And the next day, their war diarist summarized the commanding officer's exchange on the aerial effort. Quote, it was evident to all that due to adverse flying conditions, the air support had not been as great as had been expected. Pillboxes and other emplacements were still open for business when our troops touched down. End quote. Much of this was later confirmed by operations research. Yet the psychological impact on the German defenders was also a factor. Now, on the other hand, there is evidence that the Allied troops' morale was improved by the massive aerial armada deployed in support of the assault, at least when it could be seen through the overcast. This was particularly true among the reserve troops who waited offshore during the assaults. 16 miles from the coast at 0600 hours, the Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry Highlanders observed, quote, large numbers of planes pla passing over the clouds, end quote. They had yet to sight an enemy aircraft. Later, as the overcast cleared and the temperature rose, they saw their first German aircraft. Their diarist gleefully recorded that, quote, a couple of spitfires are hot on its tail, end quote. The troops appreciated the relative absence of the Luftwaffe and the presence of their air umbrella. When the Highland Light Infantry landed along with the rest of 9th Canadian Infantry Brigade, they were caught up in a large traffic jam on the beach and through bernier sur mer their diarist later recorded that, quote, it was an awful shamble and not at all like the organized rehearsals we had had. More than one uttered a fervent prayer of thanksgiving that our air umbrella was so strong. CBC war correspondent Matthew Halton was with the Canadian Assault Force and he later, he later said, quote, we expected that at any cost, the Germans would throw hundreds of bombers in against us. We expected the sky to be a crackling inferno of air battles with planes crashing into the sea everywhere but there was nothing. <laughs> and believe me, nothing was wonderful that morning. In the first hours, I didn't see a German plane. There didn't even seem to be many of ours. We began to say, it looks as if the German Air Force has finally been destroyed after all. Surely they'd use it now if they'd ever use it. So that's D-Day. Gonna move into the bridgehead in the Battle of Carpique here. As the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division settled into nearly a month of static warfare, their impressions of the work of friendly aircraft continued to develop. At times, the Luftwaffe made itself known and the troops missed their fine air umbrella. The Luftwaffe struck the bridgehead nightly, but its presence during the day was more limited, or at least that was the troops' impression. On 20 June, troops of the Highland Light Infantry were buzzed by a flight of German fighters. Apparently, quote, no one was much concerned, the diarist continued, the, the vaunted Luftwaffe has become a thing of curiosity rather than fear. We are much more interested these days in the after supper treat the Royal Air Force brings us each evening, the weather permits. The troops would watch wave after wave of aircraft bombing Caen and other nearby communication centers. On the, 23 of on the 23rd of June, the North Nova Scotia Highlanders received a visit from two Air Force squadron leaders. In the past weeks, Allied aircraft had moved to the continent and were now operating from airfields only minutes away by air. The diarist noted that, quote, the Air Force has done a great job to date in keeping Jerry out of the skies. Let's hope they continue to do so, end quote. What really caught the attention of the troops on the ground were the occasions when Royal Air Force Spitfires got involved in dogfights with German fighters. It was even more exciting when a German aircraft crashed in their vicinity. Now, the Canadians weren't alone in their positive sentiments towards the Air Force at this time. Uh, Jonathan Fennell's Fighting the People's War examines the morale of Canadian and uh, British troops in Normandy. One censorship summary of mail from six British divisions in the bridgehead reported that the support given by the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force had, quote, made a deep impression, end quote, on the soldiers, and it offered them, quote, a feeling of security. Now, the Battle of Carpique is also an interesting case. Although the battalions engaged don't have much to say about the air support uh, that helped them, the Canadian Scottish Regiment, operating an observation post from the schoolhouse in the village of Roe, had an excellent vantage point for Operation Windsor. They noted in particular the utility of rocket firing typhoon fighter bombers and helping to blunt the German counterattacks on the Canadian defenses in the village of Carpique. 
As the battalion prepared to leave the Roe area on the 7th of July, they observed RAF Bomber Command's assault on Kong. The diarist noted that, quote, morale of the troops is always greatly heartened by this evidence of Army Air Force cooperation. Now for Operation Charnwood, the um, major effort to liberate Kong, especially in the north side of the, of the, the Orn River. Bomber Command's evening attack on the outskirts of northern Caen is infamous. At approximately 10 p.m. on the 7th of July, 1944, nearly 500 Halifaxes and Lancasters unleashed their payloads behind the German front line. It was an awe-inspiring sight. The war diaries of the infantry battalions in 7th and 9th Canadian Infantry Brigades are filled with praise for this effort. There is little doubt that the, quote, very imposing site was a great morale raiser the night before battle, end quote. Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Nigel Tapp with the 3rd British Infantry Division, which had been stuck north of Caen for a month, recalled that, quote, the psychological effect was electrifying. The noise and sight of the bombardment was a tremendous morale boost. Officers and soldiers were jumping out of their slit trenches and cheering, end quote. The problem with these bombardments, um, firstly, that they were actually kind of behind the German front line, and, and secondly, um, they came six to eight hours before the troops advanced. So even if the Anglo-Canadians morale was high going into the battle, and the delay probably meant the full morale advantage probably wasn't present, the Germans had time to recover, and the troops fought a tough fight for battles, you know, the Canadians at Durand, Cuzzy, and La Baie d'Ardenne. Professor Solly Zuckerman, one of the Allied Expeditionary Air Force's operations researchers, later concluded that, quote, apart from the enormous lift to their morale, which the appearance of the heavy bombers had given, men of 3rd British Division believed that the bombing had made no material difference to the whole operation, end quote. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here um, uh, to operations uh, totalized and tractable. So we're now through Caen. Uh, the, the, the city has been largely liberated, and in fact, the South End has been liberated in, in late July as well. Um, and we're moving in, uh, uh, you know, the Canadians are getting prepared uh, to move down the Caen Falaise Road towards Falaise. It's at this point that things really started to go wrong. The plan for Operation Totalize included two air bombardments. Just before the advance on the night of the 7th of August, Bomber Command would attack German held towns on the flanks. At midday on the 8th of August, the U.S. 8th Air Force would hit what Allied planners had identified to be a second line of defenses, some of which had already been attacked by the Royal Air Force. Bomber Command made a successful attack in the evening, but during the uh, morning, two dozen American B-17s bombed short, killing and wounding 315 men of the Canadian and Polish divisions. There were 25 Canadians killed and 131 wounded in these short bombings. They were assembling to exploit this second bombardment and were largely caught in the open. And you can see in the image I have here on the screen, this is what's happening. Uh, the B-17s are bombing short uh, and, and it's just, you know, it looks like a hellscape. Um, the Canadian Scottish Regiment diarist recorded that, quote, our chief subject of concern or of conversation was the fact that Major General Keller, General Officer Commanding 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, had been wounded in the bombardment. A flight of bombers had mistaken its target and had dropped its load by a Canadian position. The morale of any troops is not heightened from such news, end quote. The North Shore New Brunswick Regiment uh, was hit rather heavily. They suffered 23 killed and 75 wounded. And artillery units, which were on wheels ready to move to new positions, not dug in as they would often be, were also hit out in the open. The 4th Medium Regiment diarist recorded, quote, the sound, the blast, the feeling resulting from that bombing is something we cannot describe, <laughs> but nobody in the regiment will ever forget this day. George Blackburn, who served with the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division's 4th Field Regiment, was spared the results of this friendly fire incident, but he later wrote, quote, what a terrible, uh, terribly demoralizing experience for divisions preparing to enter battle. The two armored divisions, 1st Polish and 4th Canadian, for the very first time. And he was right. The number one Canadian battle exhaustion unit, Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, experienced a peak in admissions from these divisions in the wake of their first engagement and the US bombing. British troops serving in 1st Canadian Army were also admitted in large numbers due to the bombing. 
Jonathan Fennell, who makes the argument that something appeared wrong with First Canadian Army in August of 1944, relies at least in part on the negative morale effects of these and other mass friendly fire incidents. Grab my slide here. So now we have Operation Tractable, and, and you know uh, th this is where you know uh, again things go wrong. Friendly fire incidents continued to plague First Canadian Army as they fought south to Falaise in an effort to close the pocket around the German armies in Normandy. This time, Bomber Command was at fault. According to Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Harris's report written after the incident, some 77 Lancasters and Halifaxes, including 44 aircraft from 6th Group Royal Canadian Air Force, bombed incorrectly. 49 of these aircraft bombed the quarry at Hot Mesnil, where elements of multiple Canadian divisions were concentrated for the drive to Falaise. In fact, Lieutenant General Guy Simmons was at the quarry along with Air Marshal Sir Arthur Conningham. The pair took cover in an armored car, which, quote, rocked violently to and fro, end quote, as the bombs fell to earth. Major Bob Suckling, commanding D Company of the Royal Regiment of Canada, later recalled, quote, even Conningham couldn't do anything to stop them. I'd like to know what he was thinking as he bounced around inside that armored car for an hour and a half, end quote. When the dust settled, 150 Allied soldiers were dead and 241 were wounded. Personnel carriers, trucks, guns, and gun tractors were smashed. Perhaps more importantly, the troops' morale and their confidence in the Air Force was shaken, if not shattered. The 3rd Medium Regiment diarist wrote, wrote, quote, the morale of the troops has never been so low and their disgust never been so great at this moment. This makes the second time our troops have experienced bombing by our own air forces and faith in close support bombing at the moment is negative, end quote. War correspondents were also witness to the devastation. Ralph Allen of the Globe and Mail wrote, quote, even those who were still unscathed were badly shaken as they emerged from reeking shell craters, dugouts and slit trenches into scenes filled with the smoke of the burning supply dumps and the noise and flame of exploding ammunition lorries, end quote. The 12th Field Artillery Regiment had a particularly rough go of things during Tractable. They lost nearly all the vehicles and trailers in one battery, and the regiment moved forward the next day to support the advance. In the afternoon, they arrived near the town of Olendal and were greeted by two Spitfires, which attacked our own troops very close by and started fires. Later on, several Mustangs attacked vehicles on the road near our position and destroyed a truck of the 43rd Battery. The entry concluded, quote, personnel very nervous now and dive for slit trenches at the sound of a plane, particularly if allied. The Canadian Scottish Regiment lost part of their war diary in the 14th of August attack. The diarist later wrote, quote, after the incident of August 14th, we don't say what planes are they, but rather where are they attacking, end quote. In fact, on the 19th of August, the diarist recorded a new term in the soldier's lexicon. Companies were informed that there was a likelihood of us being RAF'd unless forward troops displayed yellow smoke. Now these friendly fire incidents had immediate impacts on how commanders managed their battles. Ian Gooderson's research indicates that the morale impact of these mistakes uh, far outweighed the actual casualties. In fact, troops exhibited a hangover of reluctance to call for support. For instance, the uh, Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry Highlanders experienced this on the 14th of August when their commanding officer asked for armored support instead of air support because his forward companies would have to give ground to facilitate the attack. Not surprisingly, number one Canadian exhaustion unit experienced another peak in battle exhaustion casualties during the tractable friendly fire incident. Oops. Now, lastly, onto the Falaise pocket. And things start to change here, uh, but not without difficulty. Increase, the increase in friendly fighter bomber attacks did not go unnoticed by staff officers in 1st Canadian Army. Brigadier Churchill Mann, the chief of staff of the Army, wrote a friendly fire report covering the 18th to 19th August period. He warned, quote, it is considered essential that all possible steps are taken by both sides on a high priority to ensure the possibility of future attacks are reduced to a minimum. If this is not affected, this powerful weapon in support of the army will constitute a deterrent to ground operations rather than the stimulant of which it is potentially capable. Now the report goes on to list 42 incidents on the 18th and 10 incidents of friendly fire on the 19th. Uh, 
Second Canadian Corps casualties from friendly air action between the 16th and the 18th are listed as 78 killed and 209 wounded, with the bulk of these coming from the Polish Armoured Division. These casualties did not include 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, so they may have been higher. Now, all of this occurred in the frenzy that was the Allied air effort against German forces trapped in the Falaise pocket and escaping through the Falaise Gap. The return to a war of movement and the tenuous front line had led Air Marshal Serge Lee Mallory to close down the airspace inside the pocket on the 17th of August. Now, the Air Force did manage to recover its image in some circles. One British reconnaissance regiment noted that, quote, visible air support is a great morale raiser for troops who do not understand what air support is when they cannot see it, end quote. Recently, the Allied Air Forces had been quite visible, just in an intensely negative way. As the Battle of Normandy came to its end, the men on the ground got a different first-hand taste of what air power could do. In the Canadian advance to the Seine River, the soldiers passed through the shambles and the chase. These were parts of the battlefield full of German corpses and abandoned and destroyed equipment. The Stormont, Gundas, and Glengarry Highlanders entry on 23 August reads, quote, the roads are lined with wrecked enemy vehicles telling the grim story of havoc dealt to the retreating enemy by our Air Force, end quote. The Regina Rifle Regiment had slow going uh, through Vimeuter, being held up by an abandoned and destroyed German column. Quote, the column was literally caught with their pants down, and this scene of chaos and destruction makes everyone really appreciate the fine work our Air Force is doing, end quote. Now, the distance of time even seemed to have a, uh, allowed a more forgiving attitude to develop in some units. In uh, 1945, the history of the 5th Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment, which was from the 4th Canadian Armoured Division, noted that fighter bombers sometimes mistook their M10 tank destroyers for escaping panzers during the Falaise Pocket Battle. Quote, the pigeon's popularity was low, damn low, but their errors were later forgiven as the evidence of their effective handiwork became apparent in the roads leading out of the trap. I want to briefly speak um, to some of the work that Robert Engen has done um, on, uh, you know, the, the, the battle experience of uh, Canadian infantrymen in particular uh, during the Second World War. One of his sources is um, battle experience questionnaires filled out by uh, 91 junior infantry officers after their time in Normandy. Interestingly, two thirds of the officers indicated that they had received direct air support in combat and two thirds also said it was effective. Only one of the 91 officers said it was ineffective. So clearly the, it seems the positives are outweighing the negatives here. Um, when it comes to factors involved in raising morale, um, Allied air support was the third highest on the list uh, in terms of indicating um, Allied air support would give them a raise in morale. So 38 out of the 91 officers said that, 42%, which was higher than practically everything, including artillery support, except mail and parcels and food and rations. Interestingly, in terms of factors involved in lowering morale, far fewer of the infantry officers reported this, only 11 of them, the percentage being 12. Now, these are infantry officers. I suspect if they had interviewed artillery officers in, in particular, they may have gotten somewhat different numbers, especially in terms of the negative uh, uh, indicator for morale, because it's those units in particular that were hit so hard uh, uh, by, by these things. So I'm gonna conclude briefly. Um, Air support had significant positive and negative effects on Canadian soldiers' morale in Normandy. At first, the men could only make their impressions of the Air Force on what they experienced as the result of aircraft overhead or the lack of aircraft, friendly aircraft overhead. It wasn't until the end of the campaign that the Air Force left visible results of what it had done in support of the Army behind the front. Now, Canadian morale in Northwest Europe was never higher than it was on D-Day. Like their British counterparts, the Canadians received a boost from early impressions of what the Air Forces were doing in support of the landings. Yet by mid-August 1944, morale in 1st Canadian Army had suffered significantly. Casualties in the July battle south of Caen had a lot to do with this, but so too did the Allied Air Forces. At times, the Canadians and their allies were driven to fear their own Air Force more than the Luftwaffe. The friendly fire incidents were just one factor, of course, but they contrib contributed to a drop in morale that, at least according to Jonathan Fennell, helps to explain the failure of 1st Canadian Army to rapidly close the Falaise Gap from the north. 
Although only one of many considerations, casualty rates, time spent in heavy combat, news from home, diarrhea, and the general health of the troops, air support played a role in shaping Canadian soldiers' morale in Normandy. So I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Um, I've given you an, a bird's eye view of Overlord and the Air, Porn's, Air Force's contributions, which were both essential and varied. I gave you a micro history of Flying Officer Harvey Edgar Jones, a uh, Canadian airman who was recommended for the Victoria Cross but did not receive it. And as a result, we don't really know about him. I talked about air support and morale. Um, and I, I, I hope I've given you, well, this is kind of my own personal opinion, but um, I hope I've given you a sense that close air support's best effects were for and against morale, rather than perhaps the destruction of the enemy, um, heavy bombardments notwithstanding. I do want to say that those bombardments um, for totalized and tractable were still very valuable. There were bombers that bombed in the right spots and suppressed the enemy forces or, or outright destroyed them uh, standing in the, uh, the Canadian and, and, and Allied forces way. And I wouldn't want to not meant to, to denigrate the role of the Air Force at all, uh, but some of them obviously made mistakes which cost Allied lives. And finally, we talked about the air support roller coaster and how air power played a role in shaping the Canadian soldiers' morale and experience in Normandy. This is just another reason why we cannot disconnect the air power story, the Air Force story, from the stories we tell about this epic struggle. struggle. And I'll, I'll wrap up there and, and turn things over to the audience for questions. Well, thanks a lot, Alex. Um, that was uh, that was that was fantastic, and I think, you know, it's it's I've done a bit of bit a bit of it myself. It's tricky to kind of get into that um, the morale type research, and I think you've really pulled it out very well here for the audience. Um, but before I turn it over to the questions or turn it over to, to Jeff and Mike to um, conduct the Q&A for this evening, um, I would like to remind everyone, for those who, who, didn't, who has, haven't seen it yet in the chat function, I've put it there for you, um, but we actually have signed copies of Alex's book. Um, it's called Eagles Over Husky, the Allied Air Forces and the Sicilian Campaign. It was the book that, that Mike uh, held up in his introduction of Alex. He'll bring it up for you too. Um, from the 14th, from 14 May to 17 August 1943, uh, we actually have it, have it available for purchase at 10% off. Um, again, I've, I've entered in all the information for you in the chat function. For those who came in late, I'll make sure to enter it in for you one more time. Um, but for those who are interested in, in purchasing a copy, we do have it available for you um, at a discount. So that's all I really needed to say. Let's, uh, let's, let's dive right into this Q&A session. Uh, Jeff and Mike, why don't you guys uh, get us started off with the first round of questions. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Alex. Great, great presentation. Lots of uh, great comments, too, that, um, that I want to uh, pass on to you for your, for your consideration. And, and I'm really... Please, just as a, a quick kind of editorial note, the, the point you make about the impact on French civilians is really an important one. And uh, I remember um, we had that discussion quite a few years ago at one of the Laurier conferences, and it was not well received, but I think it's part of our a broader understanding of the impact of, uh, of uh, of the air war over Normandy and in and around Normandy and its impact upon French civilians is quite quite significant, quite horrendous really, isn't it? And uh, I'm glad that you you talked about that. I'm also glad, and this might come up in, in reference to uh, Robert Nash who posed the first question, any soldier's accounts, your account of uh, Flying Officer Jones is really quite gripping and, and Robert wants to know are there any other soldiers' accounts about down Canadian pilots during the Normandy campaign? Um, I, I see that question there. I'm wondering if he's also asking, um, you know, what did the soldiers see? Because they would see, you know, Canadian soldiers love to see, you know, typhoons diving in the distance on an enemy target. But they also watched as, um, you know, Halifax or Lancaster bombers were shot down over Caen um, in, 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 in those bombardments. Um, they saw, uh, you know, typhoons be, uh, being shot down um, and, and, and they're, you know, 
typhoons flying very low to the ground, uh, you know, not giving their pilots a lot of time to bail out, you know, desperately hoping to see a shoot and not seeing a shoot. Um, and sometimes even going over to, to look and see if, you know, the pilot has survived the crash. And, you know, not very common in the war diaries, but every once in a while you'll see something like that as well. Um, I would also, uh, I guess, note, um, you know, uh, you know, Harvey Edgar Jones is not the only example by far of a Canadian who was recommended for the Victoria Cross and did not receive it. Um, I mean, if you were, if you were an airman in the Second World War and you won a Victoria Cross in, for Canada, you had to die. Um, there was another uh, guy whose name escapes me right now. Um, he was a typhoon pilot who was attacking uh, radar installations before D-Day. And he actually, we don't really know for sure because no one knows but him in his last moments, his aircraft was hit and he drove it smack into the, the radar station that they were attacking. And I think there was discussion of possibly getting him a Victoria Cross, but Air Marshal Cunningham turned it down because he said, we can't, we just can't know what his intentions were in, the, in those last moments because no one's in the aircraft with him, right? So. Mm. Right, right. So the problem of defining heroism is always a tricky business in the in the Normandy campaign. And of course, I, I just have to think of Andrew Minarski. Well, and that's in August of, of 44, isn't he? It's it's June, actually. It's uh, oh, June. Yeah, yeah, it's it's and he's killed in France, uh, actually, on our on our um, we have a challenge on our route uh, march for the uh, virtual races at the Juneau Beach Center this year. One of the stops, if you want to do the challenge, which essentially you march from uh, Juneau Beach to Dieppe and then on to Vimy Ridge, on the way you stop at his grave, virtually, of course. Um, but Minarski is an interesting case. It's very similar, but it's also very different because Minarski was a gunner. Minarski was not the pilot in command. Therefore, it was not necessarily seen as his duty to stick around and to save his fellow, his fellow gunner. Whereas, you know, perhaps for Harvey Edgar Jones, it was seen as his duty because he was the pilot and he, because he was in command of the aircraft. Um, part of the question, and maybe this is something that Mike can, can raise as well, D Dave Alexander's just talked about the broader influence of popular culture in the aftermath of the war and how that might affect uh, our perception of air power either positively or negatively. And he, of course, makes reference, Dave Alexander does, uh, from Owen Sound, Ontario. Hi, Dave. That, that our image of uh, P-51s at the end of Spielberg saving Private Ryan are a great example of, of at least one perception of how air power uh, was such an important feature of the Normandy battlefield. Uh, and, and I think Mike has talked to, uh, to this as well in some of his work, and the degree to which, too, uh, and I'm thinking back to the Stacy balance sheet, uh, Colonel Stacy, our, our reference point always, who, who refers to German commentators who say that that air power had an enormous impact upon the battlefield, particularly, or not solely, but, but especially in reference to the morale of German troops. Yeah. You know, and, and I wonder perhaps both Mike and, and Alex might want to refer to that, but that impact of popular culture can also go the other way too, perhaps in ways that, that you've already referred to. I wonder if you could comment on that. Mike, I know you've talked, you've used that anecdote in, in, in the, the paper I read of yours to prepare for this. And so I might let you answer that question about Saving Private Ryan and popular culture, and then I'll chime in later. But one of the things I wanted to say about the, the German experiences is, is Yes, it's sometimes used as a crutch, I think, by the, the German commanders to explain away why they lost. At the same time, I think these are very real constraints being imposed upon them. I mean, I think there's an account where Rommel shortly after D-Day has to, now he's traveling between uh, his uh, headquarters kind of on the Seine River and the battle space in Normandy. And he has to like jump out of his car like 30 times on the road uh, between one and the other. So it's just constraining his attempt to go and, you know, liaise with his troops. Um, the same thing, uh, you know, he, he ultimately is taken off the battlefield by air power. We don't, you know, 100% know who did it. Maybe it was Charlie Fox, the Canadian Spitfire pilot. But mm -hmm. the point is, he was off the battlefield. And 
ultimately they took him out. There was a number of other uh, uh, instances where the same thing happened. Uh, shortly after D-Day, 2nd Tactical Air Force um, did a decapitation strike against um, Panzer Group West headquarters and just came in with B-25s and Typhoons and shot the place up and killed a whole bunch of staff officers and stuff. So, you know, they were literally targeting the commanders and, and the staff officers uh, in this fashion. Um, so there's a little bit of, you know, using it as a crutch, but there's also a little bit of truth in that, in that this meant that the Germans had to move at night. And that was, that's kind of the importance um, about coordination of air and uh, uh, land power. You, at the very moment, the Canadian soldier or the Allied soldier wants air support in su direct support of their advance is also the best time for the Air Force to be ranging behind the lines and attacking troop movements because the Germans only wanna move at night and there's only so much you can do at night. Uh, the intruder squadrons can only do so much and there's not very many aircraft. But during the day, if you can get the Germans to move, that's where you can do some damage. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I think the uh, Saving Private Ryan's a really interesting example. And, and thanks Dave for uh, bringing that up. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, Ryan calls them the angels on their shoulders, and uh, it, it really gets at that dichotomy between um, the expectations of close air support, tactical air support, and what it could actually do. And uh, I mean, that was a, a really fanciful uh, account of tactical air power. The uh, Mustangs were the, the cavalry coming over the hill at just the last moment, saving the day and, and going off into the sunset. And well, not quite everybody lives happily ever after, but uh, but pretty <laughs> close. And uh, the reality was that tactical air power wasn't good at hitting those kind of targets. And Alex touched on that. Um, the uh, the bombs and especially the, the rocket projectiles just weren't very accurate and couldn't hit the kinds of targets the Army wanted them to do. Um, the Air Force really wanted to fight a very different battle than the Air Force, than the Army uh, wanted. So it, it, it brings up a whole lot of really interesting questions. And I'm sorry, I've got a, uh, I think a, um, a duck cleaner service calling to uh, see if I need my ducks clean today, but we'll, we'll just ignore that for now and uh, turn that off. But I think, uh, I, th I think that sigs into a, a really interesting question that uh, Greg Hammond asks. And uh, he, he's, he's wondering about the, um, uh, Richard Romer um, and talking about the ban of um, air power in the, the Flez Gap and, and he said he felt that enemy troops couldn't attack uh, troops. Would you agree? Um, and was it a, a logical um, expectation? Well, I mean, based on the report that First Canadian Army was writing at the same time, and obviously the verbal complaints that were being made from First Canadian Army in particular, um, it's not really surprising that that decision was made to shut down the air, that airspace. Um, and in a way, what I would also say is, yeah, it's, it, it would have been nice to keep things open and, you know, but again, the, the aircraft don't always know, like the pilots don't always know what it is they're seeing. They may think they're seeing a column of German troops and it's actually a column of Canadian or Polish vehicles. And they can't tell what they are from that altitude and from that speed that they're going at all the time. So it's not the worst thing because I, you know, I, I don't have the numbers on this, but my presumption would be they didn't lower the amount of sorties that were taking place. Rather, they just used them further afield. And ultimately, that's probably what happened is, you know, instead of attacking stuff right in the gap, they were, you know, moving closer to the Sin River and, and, and shooting up enemy vehicles and stuff, you know, in that area. And so... I don't think it's quite as big a mistake as, as, as Richard Romer. Now he, he thinks now he was there. He was literally watching things from the cockpit of his P-51. And, um, you know, he had a bird's eye view of the situation. Um, but he also had a very specific view of the situation that didn't necessarily encompass all the factors to be considered. And, you know, uh, 1st Canadian Army was really getting hammered by the Air Force <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Part of what you're saying is it raises this issue, and I guess I'm coming at it from a different question. You know, the, the debate about targets, about coordination, is, is pretty frustrating, I think, from an Army perspective and perhaps from an Air Force perspective, because it didn't seem as if the two were talking to each other. And that obviously had disastrous results in the short bombings that you described from, from Total Eyes Intractable. 
Um, but when it comes to this discussion about what the Army and, and Air Force saw as preferred targets, there was a there was also a division there too. Is that yeah. is that a fair point no, to make? It certainly is a fair assessment. And I think the the issue is the Air Force wants to go after stuff, let's say, outside of artillery range. They want to go after the support side of things. They want to go after yeah. the soft skin vehicles. They realize that they can't do much against tanks except in the extraordinary circumstances and dug in positions as well. Now, I think the Army, or I should say the Air Force, underrates the importance of air support as a morale weapon, both in terms of, you know, any any time you have air, aircraft flying around, you know, that does limit what the Germans can do, right? They'll stop firing their mortars because they don't want to be spotted, for instance, right? But they didn't think, I think, as much about what it meant for the air, for the, for the ground forces. But that, that effect is very fleeting. It's very, it's very immediate. If you don't take advantage of it right away, it's gone. And so that's kind of the issue. You need to very effectively coordinate things so that the bombing strikes or whatever, what have you, go in, and then the infantry get on the objective. Because that's the time where you can take most advantage of both the German morale being low and, the, and, and them being disoriented, you know, probably not killed because you probably haven't actually done a whole lot of damage to dug in positions unless you're using heavy bombers um, and the morale of the, the troops who have seen this airstrike go in and are now advancing, you know, to attack. So mm -hmm. there's, I think the Air Force perhaps didn't understand that enough at the time. I don't know enough about what they thought about it, but I also completely, you know, I'm an air power guy who completely understands the Air Force's perspective of the battle space is larger than just what's on the front line. And, and I understand their perspective of here's what we think we can hit. Interestingly enough, the Air Force actually thought that it was more dangerous to do close air support right on the front line. Um, the opposite was actually true. It was actually more dangerous um, for pilots to be roving far behind enemy lines and that's because the Germans had positioned a lot of anti-aircraft artillery along those communication routes. And, you know, if you're further behind enemy lines, uh, lessens the chances of if you get hit that you can make it back to friendly territory, right? So uh, a couple of interesting uh, tidbits there. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, you've originally written about uh, operations over Sicily. And and Pat Dennis raises a uh, a neat point there as to as to what lessons from the Mediterranean were applied or not applied in the Normandy campaign, from uh, um, you know how was that training or how was that experience transferred, if at all, to the skies yeah. over Normandy. Yeah, I think I mean Mike can can definitely talk specifically to the uh, close air support stuff. And I'll talk a little bit to the, to the wider stuff. Uh, and Pat, nice to, nice to hear from you. Thanks for those images uh, of, of the booklet, by the way. I love those cartoons, uh, the 9th US Air Force. Um, lessons learned in terms of close air support. The issue with the Mediterranean, I guess, is, you know, especially for Sicily. Sicily is kind of, a lot of the commanders for Sicily um, I end up as the commanders for Overlord. You know, you've got Conningham, uh, Tactical Air Force. You've got Tedder, who's Ike's deputy. You've got Ike. You've got uh, Bradley, you've got uh, Monty, you know, the whole kit and caboodle there. Um, the thing is, I think they, they, they hadn't, you know, Mike will talk about this in terms of they hadn't quite in Sicily and, and even in Southern Italy developed um, really the capability for people on the spot, i.e. a fighter pilot whose tour expired, sitting in a tank with a radio talking to the aircraft. They haven't developed that in Italy yet, and they're going to develop that down the road, both in Normandy and in, in Italy. Um, it just hasn't kind of gotten there yet in 1943. What they do bring back from Sicily are a number of learnings. Um, a lot of people say that the one about um, the invasion stripes, having invasion stripes on the aircraft to help for recognition is something that came from Husky. Perhaps it did. I, I haven't seen too much evidence of that, but um, you know, certainly there was a lot of friendly fire incidents where the uh, Navy was firing at planes. Um, the case of uh, the bombardment of Pantelleria in uh, June of 1943, um, Professor Zolly Zuckerman, you know, he's, the, he's kind of the big operations researcher for the Air Force. 
and he does a study of like you know this is an island that's like basically a big fortress with coastal defense positions uh, defended by the Italians primarily not very many German, German troops on the island uh, and it falls kind of almost without a shot um, because of the bombardment or ostensibly because of the bombardment and he does a study of like okay, what happened to these coastal defense batteries and everything and it turns out the, the the carpet bombings you know they couldn't really destroy too many guns but what they could do is disorient the gunners smash you know weapon sites make the guns inoperable for a whole number of you know reasons but that was also a very sustained bombardment not a single attack that immediately preceded um uh you know a landing um the other thing is that the the transport plan um, in Sicily, uh, the Allied Air Forces focused heavily on the transport uh, system in, in southern Italy and in Sicily and all but paralyzed it. Um, you know, the, the Germans had to find other methods and the Italians as well of moving their troops around, um, paralyzing being, you know, attacking the marshalling yards, attacking the marshalling yards, because at any given time, something like 50% of all like locomotives and railway stock are in those marshalling yards. And if you can take enough of them out, there won't be capacity to do um, enough supply. Now, the thing is, is, is peacetime supply is more than enough to take care of, you know, um, a small German force or whatever. And so you really have to paralyze it. You really have to destroy a lot of it. And that takes time and effort. Um, but the transport plan that resulted in a lot of those French fatalities comes right out of the experience in the Mediterranean because they realized that this was something they could do. It was the first time that the allies had both, you know, bombed an enemy, you know, uh, nation and then also invaded that nation um, and, and got to go and see what their bombing had done to it. And, and that's a big part of it too. Um, so, you know, yes, I think the lessons were learned um, uh, from the Mediterranean. They just may not have been, you know, the lessons. I think the Northwest Europe campaign as Mike might speak to meant they had to learn a whole bunch of new lessons as well. Thanks, Pat, for that uh, that question. It's uh, it's almost a, uh, a lob ball for for Alex to take on, um, given his, his Sicily background. The uh, the question of sort of the, the lineage from well the desert to the Mediterranean to Northwest Europe is, is pretty much a straight line, and it's really interesting to see how many personnel started in the desert and moved to the Mediterranean and ended up um, in in senior commanding positions in uh, in Western Europe. So uh, Conningham and Tedder and Brown and Broadhurst um, all cut their teeth in, in the Western desert and they sort of learned by doing things and they learned what worked and they learned what didn't work. And by the time they got to Sicily, things were more or less working. But by the time they got to, uh, to Normandy, they had things worked out pretty well. And also things were going in their favor the whole time in, in the desert. They didn't have enough aircraft. They were outmatched. Uh, performance was an issue. Distance was an issue. Um, things were getting better by the time of Sicily, but in uh, Normandy, they almost had so many planes, they didn't know what they what to do with them all. So, uh, yeah, there's certainly direct lessons going back and forth, um, or not back and forth, going towards uh, the experience in Normandy, and it made a big difference. Uh, I think tactical air power was about as good as you could expect, given the, the technology and, and the training of the time. Um, we didn't have precision guided munitions. Um, there were a lot of problems. But uh, there wasn't a lot you could do to, to counter those problems, given sort of the, the state of affairs at the time. Just a question from uh, uh, from Rob Botto. Sorry, Rob, if I've mispronounced your name. The ability to bring in tactical air support. Uh, he's asking at what level was that? And, and it was clearly well beyond the battalion level, wasn't it? I mean, yeah, it was, um, that, that kind of set of silos was pretty severe you it, it wasn't a matter of saving private ryan at any stretch of the imagination in the in the british or the the commonwealth forces at that time yeah eventually eventually there were kind of there were there was always what were called uh, they developed this for even like sicily and, and, and north africa there were what were called tentacles so basically they would have air liaison officers stationed typically up to the brigade level the brigade was the closest you'd kind of get and their job would be to filter back requests to the, because um, the Air Force wanted to, you know, just, like, just like a lot of gunners would, the Air Force wanted to keep things centralized in terms of who was delivering what ordinance where and who was making these decisions. And so they would filter these requests back and they would be you know, uh, accepted, uh, modified, rejected based on a whole number of factors. 
and it could take as many as one or two hours before you know the aircraft actually arrived overhead uh, to, to do that business. There was another, and I think again, I think it was primarily at the brigade level. Um, part of the issue is you have, um, uh, and, and Michael, correct me if I'm screwing any of this up. Eventually, you have cab ranks, and cab ranks are essentially, you know, um, what, what, I, what I talked about, you know, communication directly between, you know, somebody, you know, a pilot or or, or an air liaison officer and the aircraft overhead. The aircraft overhead are basically on station for a certain period of time. And they're kind of orbiting until they get a call and then they're talked onto the target. Again, that's mainly, I think, at the kind of the brigade level. They had, you know, uh, yes, they, you know, what were they called? Like forward contact cars and things like that. Part of the issue, though, was is those if they were going to be on the front, they would be fairly vulnerable unless they could find a really nice spot to kind of sit and observe. Right. And so oftentimes they ended up just act, acting as tentacles to some degree instead of, you know, um, in, in the kind of cab rank function. The other thing about the cab rank function, which is really great in theory, um, you know, really good to get, you know, a couple minutes aircraft can come down and do what you need them to do and you can talk them onto the target. It's very expensive to maintain those. It's a very expensive use of resources. You need like a wing of typhoons or, or a group in, in American terms uh, for, for their armored column cover, you know, to make that work for even a couple of hours, right? You know, these are short range aircraft. They don't have a lot of gas. Um, you know, eventually they'll be released to do into, you know, if, they, if they're not needed to go bomb somewhere else. But regardless, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort for, you know, unless you're doing something like an advance, like in a column or something like that, it, it, it can be difficult for them to be very efficient. And I guess I'll let Mike pick up there and fill any of the gaps I may have created in that answer. Yeah, no, I, th I think you're doing a fantastic job covering those points. I think um, tactical air power is, is such a complex target topic and there's so much going on. Um, I, I just want to circle back to a question that uh, Stephen Fochuk, uh, all the way from uh, um, Yellowknife in the uh, Northwest Territories, has, has asked about um, tactical air power's use of, of the rocket projectile. And, and Alex, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, its effectiveness. I know it came up. Um, but uh, Stephen, and it's a question that's come up from some of the other um, uh, participants today about the uh, the effectiveness of the Typhoon, not necessarily in its ability to destroy tanks, but as a morale weapon. Yeah. Um, what effect did that have on, on soldiers' morale? Yeah, I think, you know, and I, I skipped some of these quotes. I have some of these quotes about, you know, uh, there's something different about being attacked from the air. You know, this is the German perspective for the most part, right? There's something different from artillery, right? It's a it's a different impact, and it has a you know it has a more sustained and longer impact on you as as a defender. Um, it's interesting because you know some of the data su suggested, or some of the interviews suggested that the um, the safest place for you to be, if you're an armored soldier, if you're a, you're a Panzer, you know, driver or whatever in Normandy, if you are attacked in the air, the safest place for you to be is in your tank. And that's because those rocket projectile, projectiles aren't very accurate. And the only way they're going to actually destroy your vehicle is if they pretty much hit you directly. There's not a lot that the, you know, splash damage or anything like that is gonna do. Bombs, it's obviously a little bit better, but they're even less accurate. So, um, now, from an allied perspective, in terms of morale, you know, you, there's there's even stuff about um, uh, the Canadians and the Scheldt. You know, they they absolutely loved seeing you know rocket firing typhoons, and it was mostly the rocket firing ones that would operate. You know, um, with with the army, I think. I mean, it, looking at the um, looking at uh, what the there was a wing of Canadian Spitfires, but they were the bomb foods. They carried bombs uh, pretty much all the time, and they tended to hit targets kind of further afield like bridges and, and other things like that. Um, occasionally they would attack in support of the, in direct support of the Canadian army, but, but more often than not, it was the rocket firing typhoons. And it was typically, there's another question in there about you know, whether there were Canadians supporting Canadians. Um, how it ended up working out is that 83 group, which contained the Canadian typhoon wing, um, it supported second British army. And then 84 group, which contained, uh, you know, which had British typhoons in particular, um, supported uh, First Canadian Army. So the Canadians, you know, this is kind of one of the things, um, actually Stacy said something about this, how it was really unfortunate 
you can understand why 83 Group wants to support 2nd British Army, because 2nd British Army is what's going to make the D-Day assault. But in the long run, they cost us the ability to maybe tell a more um, consolidated story between the air and uh, land forces for Canada, because the Canadians were not typically supporting uh, the Canadians on, on land. Right, right. It does strike me that when we talk about morale and effectiveness, I mean, it, air, air power, air force people would never really see morale as a tangible part, perhaps a supplementary part of their operation. I mean, I think, and yet we talk about, I, I keep thinking back to the Stukas in 1940 and the whole Blitzkrieg, right? Yeah, they, they hardly you know, destroyed anything. Exactly. Uh, Right, it's all right. about the perception and you know yeah. of what it's doing to you, right? Um, that's that's the thing, and you know it works kind of both ways. Uh, you know it's great to see friendly, you know friendly forces, to see you know friendly air cover overhead, and to see them you know dishing it out at the enemy because it means that perhaps you're not getting attacked. You know I think Mike in, in the paper, uh, your paper I, I just read today, you talk about how Worthington force. Um, when the typhoons came over and attacked the enemy, the German mortars stopped because they didn't want to get spotted or shot at by the typhoons. And so there's a whole bunch of, of, of morale uh, effects uh, that relate to air support that I don't think we've quite, um, you know, delved into in a, in a significant way at this point. Um, and it's really, like, it's really important. There's, there's you know, there's a, I think there's a case, I can't remember which, which um, siege it was, I think it might have been Bologna or, some, or, or one of them. They actually just had the bombers like show up and, and open their doors and fly over. And the Germans kind of, a number of Germans gave up just from that. They didn't even have to drop any bombs, right? And that was good because you didn't kill any French civilians doing that, you know, and you killed a bunch when you dropped the bombs. So there's certainly, you know, significant impacts for air power. And, and that's kind of why it gets talked up, I think, early in the war as this like more winning weapon. It's because of that morale impact. And then we're so focused on the damage it did or didn't do that we don't think to, to, to ask, well, what's the psychological impact, even if it's fleeting, you know, and, and, how does, and how does that factor into things? Yeah, that's such an important point to make because I mean, the ultimate goal of, of air power in a, in a tactical sense is to stop the enemy from imposing its will on, on your own forces. So it's best if you blow them up um, so they can never do it again, but it's almost as effective in the short run if you can uh, force the gunners to dive into a slit chinch and, and stop firing or, or make them scatter or make them hide and, and stop those guns from firing. So it's not long-term, but it is effective. And if there's coordination there, and uh, if your troops can move forward and take advantage of that lull in the fire, well, then air power has done its job. It's really tough to measure. Um, you can't go over later and, and count uh, bullet holes or, or knocked out tanks or whatever. So it's really difficult to quantify, but it's a very real effect and, and one that uh, was certainly taking place. And, and it's an interesting point um, as well to follow up on that. Gooderson makes this point in his research, which is based on operations research reports, basically. And he says that. You know, here's the thing, if you do a close air support strike and the infantry don't advance for some reason, you've essentially wasted that effort. Because if it's a, if, if it's a morale effect you're looking for, well, the Germans are going to recover in a couple of hours and your, your, your friendly troops, while they benefited from it, you know, oh, good, great to see the enemy, you know, get attacked. You know, they don't benefit from it in an attacking sense to give them the morale to go forward and to take that position. Whereas armed reconnaissance, you know, going behind the line, shooting up German motor transports, et cetera, that's, that's really never wasted, unless I guess you don't find anything. But even if you don't find anything, it still has a morale impact on the Germans, because if you're flying around, they're probably not going to be moving. They're probably going to be staying hunkered in their holes, trying not to get seen. And so just, just an interesting point there where, you know, again, this speaks to the, what the Air Force wants to target. And this is not, not something they really, I don't think, understood it very well at the time but it made sense to be attacking those targets behind the lines because there were so many other effects that were happening just from being present over that area of the battle space. Good. Um, I, I think we're coming close to the end of our uh, time here. Eric is 
nudging me virtually from the uh, confines of his uh, of his headquarters. So uh, I, I forgive as as I as I always do ask for forgiveness to uh, to our questioners. Good questions, all. We just don't have time to uh, uh, get to all of them, and I think the questions are are engaging, and I think that's a reflection, Alex, of uh, of how engaging your presentation was tonight. So thank you, Alex, and thanks, Mike, too, for your expertise in, uh, in, in understanding something about this curious concept called morale and, and how we measure it or don't measure it and how we try to understand something about its effectiveness. And, and in many ways, of course, we've been concentrated on the ground for so many weeks during our discussions, during our virtual tour. So it was nice for you to uh, raise our eyes skyward, as it were. So uh, lots more to talk about. And Alex and Mike, uh, thanks. Eric, I'll pass it over to you for the final word. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks to all three of you for such a wonderful evening. And of course, to our, to our guests, our audience for asking such, you know, great um, thought-provoking questions. Um, but our next event is taking place in, in two weeks on the 28th of July, again at our usual time at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we actually have uh, Carolyn Demore from Parks Canada, um, who's going to be coming, coming in to give us a talk on uh, the often overlooked topic of French Canadian infantry units at the Battle of Normandy. It's a talk that I am really looking forward to, one that I've been looking forward to actually from the very, very beginning of this series. Some of you might be under the impression, those maybe that have registered for the first time, that if you register for one talk, you're registered for all of them. That's actually not the case. You will have to register for each and every talk. So go to our website. If you've only registered for one so far and want to just register for more, go to our website, canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar to register for the rest of our webinars this summer. Um, I'll leave, the, I'll leave the, the webinar going for those who may want to purchase Alex's book, Eagles Over Husky. Remember, it's a signed hard copy for 10% off. So I will leave the webinar going for just a, a few more minutes for those stragglers that haven't yet had a chance to purchase a copy. But otherwise, I hope everyone stays safe. Enjoy the beautiful summer weather and have a great night. We'll see you again, hopefully, in two weeks. Take care. <laughs>